Hey everybody, welcome to Contra Thoughts. This is the last episode of Fault Lines. Going to be doing the last chapter here with guest Will Perry, the bottom line dad. We've uh, talked about the book before a couple times. And uh, again, this is the last, uh, took a few weeks uh, between the last chapter and uh, this chapter. So welcome to the show and welcome uh, bottom line dad, Will Perry. How you doing, man? Pretty well. Thank you. Thank you again, Richard, for having me back on. I really appreciate uh, yeah. your willingness to, to have these conversations. Just getting over a cold. So if I sound a little stuffy, that's what I'm perfectly okay. Perfectly fine. Good. Um, but just getting over it. So I'll good. have to mute myself when I'm <laughs> <laughs> Hacking getting out up of control with the clearing my throat and stuff. <laughs> I hear you. Well, so do you have any initial thoughts on this last chapter? I mean, it's just a few pages, really. Um, I think it's, what is it? Uh, solid ground is what it's called. Yeah. Solid ground. The last chapter here, anything yep. stick out chapter at you? 11 solid ground. Yeah. You know, I wrote a whole, a little outline and, uh, it's sometimes it's funny that just, you could say a whole lot with just a couple of pages or just with a few sentences. And I think that's what Vody Bauckham does here. Uh, just a quick bold points, uh, his personal story. I love how he starts off with his personal story. I think he's done this in a few other chapters. I think entire chapter one and chapter two were yeah. pretty much his whole personal story. Uh, I really, truly appreciate his use of scripture. Obviously, 2 Timothy 3.16, Psalm 119, 105, John 17, 17, 2 Timothy 2.15. I could go on and on and on and on and on. Lots of Bible. Yeah, absolutely. So the word of God is clear that uh, you know, it's instruction for us. It is God's wisdom for us. It is authoritative for us. It is sufficient for us. And uh, that's our foundation. We're people of the book. Uh, and so there's that. There's God's providence. There's God's forgiveness. And there's reconciliation in Christ, right? And I liked his plea at the end uh, for freedom found in Christ. And those are basically the bold uh, points that I got from this chapter, but at all of those points, I mean, you could elaborate on and we could <laughs> wax long and all those things. So, yeah, I mean, it, it was a short chapter pithy, but it was impactful, mm -hmm. uh, a, really meaningful. I had to reread some of it multiple times just to get the full effect. Like, man, that, that hit me. And I read it again. It hit me again, you know? So, mm -hmm. yeah, no, it definitely, it really caps off. I think a very, I think just, a, I mean, just a solid book. I mean, I really do. I mean, there, there wasn't much stuff about it. I know some, some critics really didn't like it or, you know, Oh, you plagiarized. Oh, blah, blah, blah. Something about Neil Shenvey and whatever. Um, uh, but again, the, the publisher came out and said that there wasn't any plagiarism and, you know, we'll give the benefit of the doubt. Unlike other people over the summer where there was a lot of plagiarism and it was evident to all um, this definitely, yeah, we won't uh, we won't mention any names, uh, or at least I won't. <coughs> Ed Litton, <laughs> Ed Litton, our president but, of our uh, our, our yeah. beloved convent convention. Uh, yeah, I've got enough videos on him. I don't want to do any more videos on Ed Litton, honestly, um, unless of him saying like, "I'm sorry." Anyway, so yeah, Bacham really. So I think he he he, and I've got a few comments, a few critiques kind of um, haters, if you will, uh, on this. And hopefully he'll drop a comment and say hello, but uh, one of them or two of them. But, you know, like, oh, Bauckham just says this, and, and there's not really any actual substance. It seems like the average attack that usually people will do is just they'll attack ad hominem, you know, meaning just a random attack or ad hoc, which is just ran ad hoc is just random ad hominem is, is attacking the person, not the actual argument. And sadly, we have such a thin skin, even in Big Eva and just the church in general, SBC, conservative evangelicalism, quote unquote, um, people are just so thin skin. And it's like, if you don't, if we don't agree on everything, then that means you hate me or you don't, we're, we're not friends anymore, blah, blah, blah. And Bauckham is, he's, I think he's gracious throughout. I really do. I think this is a, um, you know, like you said, the first couple of chapters are about his story this year, talking about 2006 how he met a pastor, an old spry 87 year old pastor uh, of a, of the, he was the father of the pastor that he, he was preaching at the church. And the guy said, welcome home. You know, and he, he said, I completely lost it there. I stood in a dirt parking lot of a church I'd never been to before. And I started sobbing and there is a level and 
there is a level that I think sometimes is lost um, that I think the critical race people and the race baiters and a lot of the, the oppressor people, they do have correct at least some degree in the sense that there, there's a deeper connection, it seems, with the black community or melanated plus or more, <laughs> more melanin, right? You know, uh, more pigmentation, whatever you want to say. Uh, African-American, whatever term you prefer than, you know, guys like us. And it's probably because there's like further distance, I guess, you know, cause it's like, I have ancestry in England and Germany and, and, and Ireland mostly. Uh, but sometimes I think I'm Italian cause I'll see other guys that are, you know, very Italian. And I often talk with my hands. I swear Matt Chandler's gotta be Italian. You got it. I mean, he's, he's flapping all over the place. I know you've lot, done lots of videos on that. Uh, he's our, one of our favorites, but multitasking he's practicing <laughs> kung fu at it's the same like, time ah, ah. he's like a mime like you know like the 80s um and so there seems to be a level in that culture in that community that's deeper than other ethnicities uh and maybe it's just because of the slavery maybe it's because of jim crow maybe it's i don't know um but i'm not going to discount it I, I, and I, I don't think bacham does either he definitely he goes on 228 and says, I forgave, not because somebody asked me to, not because of anything else. But I mean, he says even too, that he feels, I think it's on the next page that, you know, America uh, doesn't owe him anything. In fact, America has blessed me. If anything, I owe America. That's on 230. But on 228, he goes through and I forgave, I forgave this and I forgave that. And what's, what's so, again, counter, but it's the truth is that so many Africans, they didn't just come and get abducted by you know whitey and then shipped off across the ocean that did happen but there were plenty of africans who were doing that to their fellow tribesmen uh fellow countrymen and so on and so they were already and he says they were already using them as slaves most likely uh maybe political criminals whatever other tribes they you know this tribe is bigger than this tribe so they take and i mean that's what slavery has been for centuries before that right rome especially they would go in and take over an area and they kill people or is it, okay, you can be a Roman slave. And that really seems to be what happens, but you don't see that in anything with the 1619 project. You don't see anything that with Robin D'Angelo and Eric Mason and whether the secular critical race theory people or the Christian so-called secular or Christian um, CRT people, you know, talking about oppression as if it's a hundred percent their fault and 0% their fault. And that's just not reality. And I really appreciate, um, Bacham talking about that and really shedding much needed light in that regard. Yeah, absolutely. I, I really believe that he's a solid brother in the Lord. And I think as a Christ follower, he really cares about truth. He makes that clear in all of these chapters, but he makes that crystal clear in the last chapter, chapter 11. And it's interesting. He says that he's not an African. He says that he's not an African-American. He says, I am an American, full stop. Uh, and so I really appreciated that. Uh, and, and look, I, I think one of the things that he's trying to do is he's trying to say, listen, it's okay to love your family. We ought to love our family. Uh, we, can, we can have an affection and have a care for our kinfolk, uh, you know, and that's perfectly normal. That's natural, that's fine. At the same time, we ought to care about our family in Christ uh, first and foremost, right? You care about your first, your immediate family, like me as a husband. Uh, the hierarchy would go God, and then it would go my wife, and then it would go my kids. As God's word says, he who doesn't care for his own household is worse than an unbeliever, right? Uh, we read in Galatians where it says, uh, give be kind to all, but especially to those of the household of faith. And so I think what Vodi Bakum is trying to do, uh, you know, I, I think he might have coined the term, I might be wrong, so correct me in the comments, but I think he coined the term, uh, the 11th commandment, thou shalt be nice. And then he goes on to say, we forget about the other, the other rest. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I think he's trying to be nice. He's not a mean guy. He's not being offensive. But when you have these conversations, you are by nature, it's going to offend someone. Mm -hmm. And one of the good things that I think is extremely helpful with what he does is by starting off with, listen, this is the first time I've ever been to Africa. He's connecting back with his familial roots and there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Suppose I went to England or Scotland or wherever. 
that'd be fine if I did that. Now, a lot of our culture would say it's racist for me to do it because I don't have the right uh, skin color or whatever. Well, I mean, <laughs> you know, yeah. but it's it's totally fine if somebody wants to do that. Matter of fact, like you mentioned, he, he was greeted by the African pastor's dad, I believe 87 years old. Now, keep in mind, he mentions how his own dad died four months prior to this. And so it, he's he's pouring his heart out into this book. So when I read this, I'm, I'm, I'm reading into his heart. I'm getting a glimpse into his thought process. And he's really making himself vulnerable by putting all that to paper and saying, listen, my father just died. I would have loved for him to be on this trip with me to Africa. How cool would that have been? But I had to go through that. And now I'm greeted by somebody who is an ancestor or somebody who's probably somewhere along the line, an ancestor uh, mm -hmm. and, and what an amazing thing. He's crying. He just starts bawling. I'm sure his, the passing of his dad had something to do with it. I'm sure just being in a place where he knows hundreds and hundreds of years ago, his great ancestors were probably taken from. There's nothing wrong with that. At the same time, as Christians, we know our family members are those in Christ. Uh, and so and, and that is the utmost importance. And truth matters, right? We yeah. love someone. We have to tell them the truth. First Corinthians 13, six, love tells the truth. It does not bear, it does not go with uh, falsehood. Right. And, and so, you know, he, he, I like how he goes on to say, Hey, I know this book is going to be offensive. He says in this chapter that uh, he loves God more than life. He loves truth more than others opinions about him. And he loves the bride of Christ more than his platform. And I would be willing to bet that if Vody Bauckham jumped on the woke train, if he jumped aboard the CRT social justice train, he would have more popularity. He yeah. would be more prosperous. He'd have more political clout. Uh, he would be touring the Gospel Coalition's website. He would be authoring every article on the Goth TGC website. He would be in the Christian Post, Christianity Today. He would be on all the big Eva circuits because everybody would be a giving him applaudance and pats on the back. Yeah. But instead, what do we see? We see everybody chastising him, everybody belittling him, everybody saying he's trying to curry favor with certain people and that sort of a thing and slandering him. And it's just really bizarre, but I truly appreciate how he is backing up what he's saying, not only with his own personal experience and history and life story and pouring his heart out, so he's doing so in love, but he's also doing truth. He's, he's doing both. Ephesians 4.15, speak truth in love. They're not mutually exclusive. And when I read this, I'm reading his heart and I'm also reading the truth, right? He talks about contending for the faith. Uh, he mentions Jude, chap uh, Jude, the only one chapter in Jude. Uh, I was going to say Jude chapter three, but <laughs> it's not myself. The Jude, one the, verse three. One of the um, hidden ones. talks about exposing darkness, Ephesians 5.11, warning others, 2 Timothy 3.15. And he talks about correcting people, 2 Timothy 2.25. And so mm -hmm. I really appreciate that. And uh, I'll give give it to you for some more thoughts. Yeah, no, I mean, it's definitely, I mean, he says he writes the book because he loves God. Like you said, he loves the Christ, the bride of Christ and uh, more than his platform and everything else. And, you know, I, and I think I know that's my sentiment, um, just even why I do this channel, why you do your channel. Uh, go check out Bottom Line Dad if you haven't, by the way. Um, now I'm talking to the audience, not you, because you've already checked out your channel. That'd be weird if I told you to check out your channel. And, you know, like there is a level of like, oh, niceness and this. And, you know, like even last year uh, in 20, early 2020, when John Harris had, you know, the kind of expose with uh, Russell Fuller, who was fired from Southern. And, you know, there's other people in A.D. Robles. And we know those people have been around longer than us. And oh, you're just, uh, yeah, I don't know, you know, why you mean and this and that. And, and it's like. It leads me right to Machen's quote, uh, and I'll back up here in a second after I read it. But he says, men tell us that our preaching should be positive and not negative, and we preach the truth without attacking error. But if we follow the advice, we shall have to close our Bible and desert its teachings. The New Testament is a polemic book almost from the beginning to end. And Machen, 100 years ago, Presbyterian, it was before the PCUSA went off the rails, and he was, you know, Christianity and Liberalism is a great, great book. I highly recommend it. Uh, but he also mentioned Spurgeon, or he mentioned, Baca mentioned Spurgeon, which was about 50, 40, 40, 50 years before that, uh, before Machen. 
and the downgrade controversy. You might be familiar with that, especially as Baptists. You hear a lot about that in college and uh, hopefully in church because it's the same type of idea. It's just the leftism. It's the unbelief. It's we're not going to trust God's word. Uh, it's not sufficient. It's not infallible. It's not inerrant. And that's exactly what we're seeing now. Um, and that's that's a topic that's near and dear to my heart because I think we can glean a lot from both Machen and Spurgeon and what they did and how they stood for the truth because it does it didn't go well for the opponents of Spurgeon and Machen and it's not going to go well for the woke crowd it's not going to go well for the CRT people um, both in this life and in the next especially if they're using that as their salvation and not Christ I'm not saying if you're woke you're not saved not necessarily but you're putting another gospel and Paul calls that damnable. He calls that anathematized. And it's very, very dangerous. And so, yeah, Bauckham is very clear. You know, I want you to pull back, you know, kind of uses several illustrations, expose the wizard, like, you know, the wizard of Oz, pull back the curtain, take off the shedding light, uh, boy who cried wolf, emperor has no clothes, that sort of thing. And I think we can really do that. And, and we should do that in a loving way. I mean, that's again, why I, try and do some of this not all my channel not your all not all your channel either but you know when we see the false teaching or you see just lies coming from even respected pastors and you're like what are you what are you doing what, what happened to the bible where where is that in the scripture you know and the average christian the average you know person in the pew or even just average pastor is like huh since when you know, I mean, you can you can attest to that throughout your comments and talking to people. I can, too, that so many times people just I just want the scripture. I want to know how what it meant for them then and how it applies to me now and not some weird twisted amalgamation of, of something else. This isn't the Bible. This isn't helpful. And, you know, Bauckham seems to have really encapsulated that uh, throughout and really having the scripture be his foundation. Right. And looking at how these things apply and. uh and work themselves out. Absolutely. I completely agree. And, you know, he mentions how hard it was to write this book, right? So when we speak the truth in love, it's not an easy thing, right? Because automatically when you tell someone the truth who doesn't want to hear it, or if it conflicts with their worldview or the paradigm by which they view things, uh, if they're viewing, whether it be through their sexuality, whether it be through their pet sin, I think we all have a sin that begets us that we just struggle with. Uh, maybe it's drunkenness, maybe it's sexual immorality, maybe it's theft, you know, covetousness or whatever it may be. Uh, when it comes to CRT or woke or social justice, I, I, I think it's all synonymous. So I kind of, you know, and sometimes I almost hate saying CRT or social justice or, or mentioning it because I almost try to uh, get around it. There's almost no way to get around it, but I almost try to just stick with the Bible because there's so much that's a baggage that's attached to those words, you know, uh, but it's sin. Essentially, it, it comes down to a sinful paradigm that's not a Christian paradigm. And I, I think he's right to call it out as not the gospel. In fact, it's anti-gospel. It is avoiding Colossians 2.8. It is avoiding 2 Corinthians 10.5 and Ephesians 6, spiritual warfare. It's avoiding all these various things throughout scripture where it gives us warnings uh, because what it does is it takes into account the world and it tries to adopt and embrace the world and then it makes you sound like the world in order to try to share the gospel with the world and you just simply can't do that you know i can't go to a gay bar and i had really bizarre example but i can't do that and or a strip club you know or a, a bar a regular bar and start throwing back shots and then make the claim that i'm there to share the gospel with people who are just habitually getting drunk. I know drunkenness is a sin, uh, and I know that these people shouldn't do that. They need to know Jesus. So what am yeah. I going to do? I'm going to go to the bar, and I'm going to partake in slamming shots. Anybody who's a thinking Christian would say, no, brother, that you don't do that. You're not mm -hmm. supposed to. That's not helpful. And that's exactly what people are doing with CRT, with social justice, uh, with all this sort of thing. They are taking on the world and they're embracing it and they're using the worldly tactics of, quote unquote, anti-racism, which is itself racist. Mm -hmm to embrace the world and try to make it look, well, I'm anti-racist. I think CRT is a good, it's an analytical tool. Uh, yes, I am for social justice, 
but they don't I, I, either, you know, at a certain point, I don't know if it's, I would rather attribute it to ignorance instead of malice, but mm. at a certain point, you got to say, Hey, watch out for these guys, avoid these guys because they've been taught, they've been corrected. They're refusing correction. Therefore avoid them because at a certain point it's like, gosh, if you don't see this, you know, he repeats over and over again, uh, in the first couple of pages, God's providence, mm -hmm. God's providence by God's providence. Uh, and then he goes on to say, forgiveness, forgiveness, forget. I yeah. mean, this is, it's a theme that's repeated in the first few pages of this chapter. And that is something that modern day social justicians don't do. They don't ever talk about the providence of God. They don't like these things are in place. He's, he's praising, he's able to praise God and say, because of God's providence, I'm an American. He goes on to say, hey, I live in the most prosperous, freest, blessed, great republic in history, which I think is true. Yeah. Um, he goes on to say, hey, I'm happy to be essentially saying I'm happy to be an American. That's how I identify. I'm a Christian first and then I'm an American second, even though he's taking a trip to Africa, which is great. And he's bawling his eyes out when he's seeing somebody who's in his ancestral familial line. So those are good things. But Christ first and, you know, you know, just truth. Uh, and the truth is forgiveness, not bitterness, yeah. not anger, not resentment, uh, not victimization, but forgiveness, which we all need, which is only found in Christ. And with woke CRT social justice paradigm, you can't you don't see or hear forgiveness. All you hear is shame. You hear guilt. Uh, you hear blame. It's not me. It's not my responsibility. It, it ain't my fault. It's the other guy's fault. And how do you know that? Based on how much melanin you have. What color is your skin? Tell me the color of your skin, and then I can categorize you and judge you as the victimizer or as the victimized. You are oh. the oppressor or you are the oppressed. And he's absolutely right to call it out as a different gospel. It's an anti-gospel yeah. because it judges the outside appearance and it says these people are good and clean um it's almost pharisaical right and these people are the good people um, and you need to be in the good graces of these people there's no forgiveness there's no talk about god's providence there really ultimately is no reconciliation and i really appreciate how he mentions again backing up what he's saying with scripture he mentions uh joseph uh the story of joseph in genesis 50 20 where he says God meant uh, you, what you meant for evil, God meant for good, right? When we all know the story of Joseph, if you don't go read it, um, where he's, his brothers sell him to some uh, traders, they, they take him, he goes to Egypt, he's a slave. Um, he ends up being uh, the high, right directly under Pharaoh, you know? And, and so by God working through him, he's able to save a lot of people by storing up food, etc. cetera. Uh, and so it's a, it's an amazing, amazing thing. And I love how he backs it up with scripture. I love how he mentions that, but again, there's no forgiveness. There's no mention of God in, in modern day social justice talks. I always put those uh, air quotes around it because it's just mm -hmm. not true. It's, it's not based on truth. It's not based on grounded in the word of God. Um, and it's actually antithetical to the Bible. It's antithetical to the gospel, um, you know, so. Yeah, no, it's definitely, uh, I mean, he really weaves that throughout the scripture or throughout this book. Um, and he does turn a lot of tables over, as it were, flipping them in the temple of CRT and, and wokeness and all that. Because he then talks about, you know, why stop at slavery and Jim Crow? You know, some people, all oh, the 1619 Project, that's when really America started, and it's founded on uh, slavery. And that's why people like this, that's why they want to destroy America. They want to show, or they want to destroy America, and they want to have a new paradigm come in. That's really what it's about. So, I mean, if you're watching this and you're kind of on the fence, that's what this goal is. It's not about preserving whiteness and oppressing other people. No, America is the most prosperous, is the wealthiest, is the most healthy. Now, despite the fact that we have fast food galore and people have diabetes and heart disease and cancer and everything else, uh, we those are all self-inflicted, right? These aren't like bad, you don't have dirty water and you have dysentery or something. But he talks about these things. And then he pulls it up and says, yeah, but why are we going back to this or this? Why not go back further? I mean, what about Rome? What about Egypt? What about Babylon? All these were massive slaveholders. They oppressed massive people. Are, I mean, are people going to Rome now? Are they beating down the door of the Vatican, demanding reparations from the Pope? I mean, he'd probably give it because he's such a lefty. But, um, 
<laughs> but like going to Egypt and saying, oh, you know, we built those, or my, my great, 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 great ancestors built those. And I, I need thousand dollars a month from the Egyptian government because you oppressed my people. I mean, Jewish people could do that. Hebrew people could do that uh, on and on and on. And it's just nonsense. I mean, my people, the Germanic tribes, probably your people were enslaved by Rome at some point. Does that mean I get reparations from from Rome or from Italy or from somewhere else? No. You know, and so I, I really appreciate that it multiple times throughout the text of this book that he, you know, flips those tables over and says, no, no. My last chapter, I think, was the three fifths person paradigm of it was three fifths slaves. And they were counting uh, the amount of the, the people, not that the person, each person was only three fifths of a person. But that's still taught today. And like I, I was taught that. And uh, I think it was Jason and I talking Whitaker uh, and he had said, oh, yeah, I learned that. And he was in public school in, in Illinois at the time, way back when. So, you know, people do teach it, but it depends on your teachers and it depends on their agenda and depends on how much or how little um, of ignorance they have or, or what they're really looking to do. So, yeah, looking, I mean, he doesn't, he doesn't excuse uh, certain things. I mean, he, he does go through like the certain things like racism and he wraps up with that and we'll, we'll get there in a moment. Uh, but he talks about the providence. He talks about forgiveness. He talks about real, tangible, God-honoring, gospel-focused goodness, right? You get redeemed in Christ. That's what it is. It's not this treadmill of apologizing and, and saying, I'm sorry, and reparations, and how much money is enough money, and how much time is enough, and how much apologizing should we do. It's, it's never ending. And it's a big, a big business. I think you just posted a video on yours, right? You said... Uh, identity what was it that some guy on a channel or it was a yeah um talk Colston Ber bernard i think he is a jamaican olympic champion runner i i think his he grew up in jamaica if i'm not mistaken i don't know a ton about him uh not his uh biographer by no means yeah. but uh i think he's an olympic champion former olympic champion uh i think his dad he said worked over 110 hours 100 hours a week uh busting his butt working hard uh farming didn't doing all these other things i think he he moved uh his family to canada and they eventually moved i think here to the u.s if I'm not mistaken, but yeah, they were talking to him. And I mean, you're talking about a, a, a black man, uh, you obviously Jamaican. Uh, you're talking about somebody who is an immigrant. And I, I think he was running for Congress last I checked. And, and so, or to be a citizen, some, something like that. And uh, he's successful. He's doing really well. And here he is saying, I'm not a victim. It's not in my language. It's not me. It's not how my parents taught me. Yes, history happened, but I'm wildly successful now. Uh, and so it's because they instilled in me faith, uh, God. They instilled in me hard work, ethic, and that sort of a thing. And so... You know, you made a good point at mentioning how Vodi brings up, and you and I have talked about this in other videos, which is this, that we can't be unbalanced, right? And and that's what the whole thing is. This, this anti-gospel CRT woke stuff is unbalanced because they'll, they'll call out partiality, which is the biblical sin, I think, uh, but racism. It's obviously a sin, but that is the focus. There's never any forgiveness. There's never any God's providence. There's never any grace. It's always, it's always about racism and it's always a particular kind of racism at a particular time. It's about slavery. It's about Jim Crow. It's about redlining. It's about uh, all these other things. Emmett Till and, and hey, Full stop. Those were evil. Those are sinful. Those are wrongs. I am not up here saying, hey, Emmett Till, that thing that happened to him. That's it's horrible. It's tragic. It's, it's evil, sinful, partiality, uh, murder. It, you name it. Awful. Awful. Nobody is saying that didn't happen. Nobody is saying there aren't individuals today who are committing evil sins. Of course there are. But that's the focus. And there's never forgiveness. There's never nothing. If you are in a particular melanin group, you are automatically guilty via your looks on the outside. And if you're in another melanin group, you're automatically not guilty. And so you're automatically a victim. You're automatically oppressed. And so, you know, there's no reconciliation. In fact, he brings up the mantra. Uh, Vodibakum mentions in chapter 11, he says, no reconciliation without justice. Uh, and many people have probably heard that, you know, no justice, no peace. 
uh, no justice, no reconciliation. And he says in his head, whenever he hears that, he screams, um, yes, and the death of Christ is that justice, right? Ephesians chapter four, he mentions Ephesians four verses 31 to 32 says, forgive each other as Christ forgave you. So we're, we're speaking primarily to Christians. Uh, if you're in Christ, you know, God has, I, Hey, I'm the worst sinner. I know I'm the worst sinner that I know. And God has forgiven me of sins. And, and I'm so grateful. So I have to go be forgiving to others. I can't shame people. I can't guilt people and bash people and that sort of thing. Now I could call people to repentance and faith in Christ. Of course I could share the gospel and say, Hey, have you committed the sin? Have you um, been sexually immoral? Have you been drunken? You know, all these other things. Well, God requires, you're going to have to stand before God and give an account, Romans 14, 12, right? Uh, among other passages. And so if you don't repent, put your faith in Christ. Well, you know, you, that's the only way to be saved from the wrath that you so deserve. We're saved by grace through faith. It's not of works that anyone can boast and so on. Um, but yeah, the, this there's reconciliation in Christ. Uh, just a quick quote from chapter 11. He says, who am I to tell a white brother that he cannot be reconciled to me until he has drudged up all of the racial sins of his and his ancestors past mm. and made proper restitution? Christ has atoned for sin. And if we're Christians, that's the main thing. <clears throat> yeah. we're, we're that, that dividing wall that was separated with Christ. Christ has reconciled us. And if we're in Christ, we're family. You know, I can't look at somebody and say, you're oppressed and you're a victim. The reason I know that is because you're black. I'm the oppressor and I'm privileged. The reason I know that is because I'm white. To me, that's racism. That's yeah. the sin of partiality. And, well, and it is. I mean, it really is. Yeah, I mean, so I think he does a great job exposing that. Yeah, no, he definitely does. I mean, it, and that's a, a good point overall because he uh, and you brought it up as well. And, and I know you this, that's just kind of your oftentimes your focus, even on some of the video, videos you do and such, that the Jew Gentile divide was crushed. And, and I mean, he says it's far more significant than the black white divide. If Christ took care of that on the cross, how much more did he take care of any man-made divisions we face today? Does that mean there is no racism? Of course not. Does that mean there is no important issues uh, for us to get to know each other, hear each other's stories? No. If I believe that, that I wouldn't have written the first two chapters of this book. If this mean what it does mean is that we do not occupy a space of oppressors and oppressed based solely on melanin. And again, and that's and that's where a lot of people will people just you know, people who don't want to understand the argument. And again, we've run into this. I've run into this even on these this series of, of what 10, 11 videos I've done over the last few months, you know, and they'll drop weird comments and you're like, it has nothing to do with, there's nothing to do with it. What are you talking about? Like nobody said, I didn't say that there wasn't racism. Fody Bagham doesn't say there isn't racism. He doesn't say that there's not issues. You know, one guy is like, oh, everything lines up with critical race theory. I don't find anything in the Bible that's against it. And it's like, are you reading the Bible and are you reading critical theory? Because the, yes, it's a legal whatever. And that's where a lot of people kind of get around it and like, Oh, we're not teaching legal doctrine to students at second grade. And it's like, no, they're not. Although I heard it recently. Um, they're not, they're not doing that. But what the guy said was in this interview is that they're doing the praxis, right? Orthopraxy, just like orthodoxy, doxa, right? The, the literature and, and stuff orthopraxy is where we get like practice from. So they're, they're doing the praxis orthopraxy of critical theory of telling, Hey, you guys are oppressed. You guys are the oppressors. You should say, sorry, you should do this. You need to do this. You need to look at these people with differentiated lenses. You need to put on the CRT lenses and you need to see little Susie Q. She's got more melanin. Her hair is darker. She's got, you know, this and that. And you should see, you should feel sorry for her. And that's really what it boils down to. I mean, it, I don't know why any, anyone with, you know, African descent, more melanated, whatever, would want to be part of this because it's demeaning. It's stupid. It's, oh, poor little black guy. Yeah, we need to give you, we'll lower the standard. We'll take care of this. I mean, the, was it the Portland uh, governor or Oregon governor re removed a bunch of things recently about helping black kids. By removing all these standards, 
And it's like, I'm sorry, that's not going to help them at all. That'll just lower the bar and then keep them on the ground, <laughs> right? As opposed to saying, you're probably going to actually have to work harder because of what you look like, because there still is problems. There are still sinners. There are still racist people and people have, there's a past. So you got to work harder, my friend. You got to work extra hard, not slack and do 25 percent not 100 percent. you got to do 110 percent, 120 percent if you're going to exceed and uh succeed and excel in this world and and it's it's so it's so abhorrently racist that the people have the blinders on that everybody who's pointing everybody else as being racist they're really the racist ones they really are and it's and it's kind of sad i mean it really is and i mean i feel sorry for them honestly because not only do they do that but a lot of times even in the church do it and we see, you know, like you mentioned, critical or critical um, gospel coalition, you know, and, and big pastors like David Platt and Matt Chandler and a lot of these other guys, they know better. They know better. And they they think they're helping and they're not at all. I mean, they're grabbing gasoline, thinking it's water and well, well, it's clear, I guess, kind of. And they throw it on the fire thinking it's going to help. And then they're wondering why it blew up in their face. And it's like, oh, you threw gas on the fire. That's not the right thing to put out a fire. <laughs> like. It's yeah. It, yeah. The church you know, knows better. The, the thing is, there's an activist component to this ideology. And I say ideology because it is a different ideology. It is a different paradigm. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm sorry. It is a different worldview. It's a different way of putting, you know, Jason Whitaker from Dear Woke Christian talks about it often. He does an excellent job. He says, hey, he'll you'll see a little thumbnail of his face and he'll go to the Bible. He'll say, hey, here's what the Bible says. Hey, here's what this guy is saying. The two are not comporting together. <laughs> They're not lining up. So the activist part of it is a feature. It is not a bug. It is part of it. So it essentially boils down to being a game of semantics where they'll say, hey, it's not as if they're saying, hey, class, we're going to talk about CRT today. Hey, class, we're going to talk about being woke and social justice today. No, they'll just say, hey, we need the black kids over here. We need the white kids over here. We need these kids over here. This is literally something that was done at a Colorado elementary school recently. There are people who have relatively big platforms who have done I mean, uh, excellent job exposing CRT in school, CRT in the public uh, sphere. Uh, Christopher Rufo is a name that comes to mind. I don't think he's a Christian, uh, although I, obviously I wish that he would become one. Uh, I, I'm not 100% sure on him. Neil Shinvey. Neil Shinvey has done excellent work. Excellent work. He has a whole uh, Facebook page. I would highly recommend people follow him, uh, be it so, uh, Facebook, social media. I don't think he's on YouTube at all. Uh, but he has a whole thing where he says, hey, this is CRT. Uh, this is CRT in its own words. And essentially what it comes down to is this, I, I hesitate to say race essentialism, because I know as a Christian, there's but one race, uh, human race, uh, all fallen in Adam, uh, you can say, and then there's the race in Christ, if you put your trust in Christ. Uh, but uh, Acts 17, 26, God made from one man, every nation, uh, and so and set their lands and whatnot boundaries. Uh, but the point I'm making is that there is a, a racial essentialism where everything is boiled down to your skin color. Everything is viewed through the lens of your skin color. And it's like, and it's so uh, subversive to Christianity. It's ironic because it's omnipotent. Uh, it's omni omniscient. Uh, it's, it's all powerful. It's everywhere. It's in the ether. And, and the funny thing, yeah, it's, it's just, it's all over the place. It's, it's racism. Everything is, it's reductionist, right? It's reductionist. This pen, it's racist. Uh, this cup, it's racist. Uh, my cell phone uh, is racist. It's definitely um, racist. Roads are racist. Definitely. Everything. Everything's yeah. And, and it's so silly, you know, peanut butter and jelly That is literally, I've, I've, I don't obviously have the article to be like, jelly. here it is, but literally I'm not making this stuff up. Peanut butter and jelly sandwiches are racist. Uh, was that really an article that said that? Seriously, there, there is a little. Uh, kid you not? I can. I can. Give I mean, it I'm to not surprised. Even, I don't know. I got. Yeah, almost I think it was. Uh, you know, I think even the president. Uh, I think it's JoeBiden.com. I think they were trying to make climate Joe change, racist? like He's climate racist. justice, and they were saying, "Hey, you know, weather changes are racist, uh, and it's due to climate <laughs> change, and and it's because oh you goodness. know they they built cities and they have." poorer communities in such a location on purpose because they want 
all the uppity white people to be out in the suburbs and I, you know everything is viewed through this lens and this is you know and, and so that's a you know and that's why you would have pastors like david platt saying things like yeah. you know uh, let justice pour down like waters and as a white pastor i'm part of the problem you know i i love how Vody calls out people and says hey this is something within the church he says pastors i beg you to consider what i've written here i believe the church your church is under attack and as shepherds we must defend the sheep um, yeah. and, you know, and you have people like david platt who has a big platform who is a pastor who should know better? By the way, James 3 1 says, not many of you should be uh, pastors or teachers, right? Because you'll be judged at a higher standard. You should know better. Um, right. People like Matt Chandler, hiring practices, you know, you should know that's cute. <laughs> He's, yeah, no. Yeah, four of them myself. So I know it's but, true. You know, and this stuff has been embraced. It's one thing to say, okay, the it's out there in the world. That's what the world's doing. That's one thing. Uh, but but for the church. The church you know, it's, yeah, it's disgraceful. Call it it really out. Say, hey, this is not of God. This is not a biblical worldview. This is not viewing things through the lens of Christianity. So yeah. um, give me one second. Let me see what this yeah, no worries. little boy exactly. needs. All right. One sec. All right. Sorry about that. <laughs> no worries. I have, we have four of them ourselves, so I have yeah. to really get it. <laughs> it's just like he's asking me about Legos, so it's classic. Um, That's yeah, important no, stuff. It is. It is. We got some new Lego sets for, for Christmas. It was good. Nice. Um, mostly Star Wars. They're good. Sweet. Uh, yeah, so he... It, it really is, though. I mean, and, and I think that's the thing that Bauckham's really trying to get to. He's trying to get to the church. And really say, okay, listen, I understand you might have a, a spot in your heart for this particular thing. You know, and there's people for a long time, they vote Democrat because, oh, Democrats care for the, the, the lower class. They, I'm a union guy. They help poor people, blah, 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 blah. And really, let's be real here. No, neither party helps poor people. They really don't. Um, they can make a lot more money by having people put down and oppressed and, and you know, making promises that never come true. But that's where a lot of people use. And then that kind of same mantra, then people say, oh, there's victimization out there. There's problems in the world. There's this, there's this, there's this. And we need to do something about it. This is the modern civil rights. And it's like, I mean, it's really not, though. And where did all this come from? Because you talk to the average average person and they think, well, regardless of what they look like, it's like, yeah, no, I mean, America is a prosperous nation. We're, we're blessed. We've got a lot of things, especially Christians. You know, we've got more freedom than we could possibly imagine and everything else, even still. And yet there's like a small group of people that are pushing this. And it is it is very much an agenda. It's not something that's just organic, that's just been happening because of injustices in the world. Yes, there's injustices. And we talked about that in previous chapters. Uh, I forget which chapter it was, maybe five or six. And, you know, the different Breonna Taylor and, of course, George Floyd and this guy and that guy. But then there was the Tony Timba guy who's, you know, looks like he could be cousin of ours. And nobody talked about it at all. And he was exactly like George Floyd, but even worse and was held even longer and all this, this and this. And he also died. And there's no riots. There's no anything. There's no bricks through windows. There's no problems. It's just, yeah, I got killed by the police. That kind of stinks. And it's like. Why? Well, because it doesn't fit the narrative, right? It doesn't fit the agenda. And and Bauckham has done a fine job really exposing the agenda and really naming names, which I think is is helpful. It's it's again, I mean, he says, I don't want to <clears throat> what does he say? I think it's the previous page here. Um I don't I'm not making fun of these people. I'm not saying I don't like these people. Nothing. It's rather the opposite, like you mentioned with uh Timothy and Ephesians. Uh, 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy and 
correcting and escaping the snare. And there's, there are ideologies and we so often forget in the church that there is a, an enemy. We have someone who seeks to destroy us, who wants our marriages to fail, our children to, you know, shrivel up and die. He doesn't want the church to meet. He doesn't want people to live unto Christ. He doesn't want the gospel preached and proclaimed. And, you know, if we can get sidetracked, which we are desperately sidetracked with something like this, especially in the church, then we're not talking about essential matters. We're talking about something that is a sin, but the solution isn't Christ, but something else, which I don't even know what it is. I've, I've talked to people and even other critical theory people, and they don't they don't have a solution. It's just apologize more. Say sorry yeah. again. Give me some money. And it's like, yep. I don't owe you anything. Shut up. Like, <laughs> yeah. And you mentioned do the work, right? I mean, I, I don't yeah. know. I forget how you phrased it just a moment ago, but uh, it's a workspace thing, right? And it's, it's the gospel plus. It's the yeah. gospel in addition to doing the work. That's the phrase we hear often with the social justice movement, with uh, CRT peddlers. It's do the work. You always and forever have to do the work. Jesus lifts that weight off our shoulders. The amazing thing, the reason why it's good news is that it is not my work. Uh, Romans 1.16, uh, salvation is the power of God period, mm -hmm. all for all who believe, right? And, and so you know, Ephesians 2.8, we're saved by grace. God does the work. God yeah. does this for me. It is a gift. I didn't do it. There's nothing I can do to save myself. I can't, uh, you know, and, and so it's by God's grace and it's, and um, there's an unbalanced. So there's a, it's a separate gospel. You can't say, well, you know, you believe in Jesus and do this, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's believe in Jesus and do the work of anti-racism. Well, what's anti-racism? Well, hiring the black guy even if he's less qualified than the white guy, which is right. what Matt Chandler says. I, people give me a hard time for picking on Matt Chandler. Listen, I'm the guy that used to listen to Matt Chandler when I worked out. Uh, I used to be uh, into his sermons. Like I used to be like, man, this guy's getting fired up and <laughs> passionate, just like I'm passionate. I love Jesus. He seems to love Jesus, you know, but when he goes off the rails, I don't want to make this about Matt and veer off on a rabbit trail here and squirrels everywhere and stuff, you know, but uh, <laughs> it, it's in the church. This stuff is inside the church. We're not talking about the world. The world's going to do what the world's going to do. Mm -hmm. But when you have Christians who are proclaiming grace of God, proclaiming Christ, uh, and then they're adding to it as if you're not really a Christian, if you're not out picketing, if you're not out rioting, if you're not out doing the work of supposed anti-racism, if you're not out shouting for supposed social justice, in the same way that the world is doing it, then you're not really a Christian, you know, then you're not really saved because you're not doing the work, you know, yeah. and that's where it gets very scary because it's like, that's not the gospel. That, that is, so. that is a gospel that will damn you. That won't save you because you can't save yourself. You can't do enough works to save yourself and it's imbalanced, right? You mentioned uh, Tony Tempa and, and these other names. Uh, I've mentioned before Daniel Shaver. Uh, there was that girl, Sierra Meyer, who was, I think she was a 12 year old girl, white girl. I yeah. think her dad was being served a, a warrant. I think maybe he was back on pay or something. And police came to, I forget the whole narrative, but uh, he had a gun and pulled out his gun. Cop shot at him. A bullet went through his arm, killed the girl. Uh, yeah. We don't hear about that story. You know, uh, if anyone's familiar with uh, the bottom line, dad YouTube channel, there's a conversation I had with uh, someone named Carla and in our conversation, she mentions, uh, now I like talking to people that disagree with me. I want to hear them out. Uh, I love them. I want them to hear the gospel. I harbor no resentment. I harbor no bitterness or anything like that. And so I asked her straightforward. I said, hey, do, do you know the name Tony Tempa? Nope. Do you know Daniel Shaver? Nope. Do you know Sierra Meyer? Nope. You know, and I could just go down the list, name after name after name after name. They don't know these names. They don't know these names, but they do know George Floyd. They mm -hmm. do know, you know, uh, Ahmaud Arbery and all these other things. And, hey, I'm not saying, hey, it's good what happened to George Floyd. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying individual cases like this ha don't happen. They do. Of course they do. People get murdered. That's a horrible thing. People get raped. That's a horrible thing. People steal things and rob banks. That's terrible. That's mm -hmm. terrible. No one's condoning that. Nobody is condoning that. 
what we're saying is that we have to have a balanced approach. Uh, I think it's Proverbs 18, 17. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but it says that uh, the one who states his case first seems right until the other comes and, and counter examines him, right? I'm probably misquoting it a little bit there, but uh, the point is, you know, we have to have a truthful balance as followers of Christ. Vody Bauckham says this, hey, I care about truth. I love God and I care about truth more than I do my platform. Going back to what I said earlier, if he was doing this book, if Vody was writing this book so that he can build his platform, so he can make a name for himself, how easy in modern day culture, how easy would it be for Vody to say, look at my skin. I am a victim. Look at your skin. You're the oppressor. Yeah. My people have been hurt by your people. We need reparations. We need this. You need to divulge of your whiteness, <laughs> whatever that, whatever that would be. Whatever that means. You need to do the work of mm -hmm. anti-racism. Vody could be the Christian version of um, Ibram X. Kendi. I know Jamar Tisby's doing it. Mm -hmm. And Jamar Tisby, I think, is, is making bank. I think he works for Ibram X. Kendi now. Vody could do the same thing. He could yeah. jump aboard the woke train. Uh, he could jump aboard the anti-racism train. He'd be on MSNBC. He'd be on CNN. He would be on NBC, ABC. <laughs> he would be, if he was doing this book for his platform and for political clout and to be prosperous and all of the other things, he would just do what the culture's doing. But he's not. He's mm. being counterculture and they don't like that. The people don't like the truth. And that's why he's getting a lot of pushback. That's why people right now are calling him a pick me. They're saying Vody's a pick me. They're mm -hmm. calling him an Uncle Tom. I think he's actually in a documentary that's about to come out called Uncle Tom. I know they did a part one with uh, the, the black face of white supremacy. What was his name from California? Oh, Larry Elder. Yeah, I saw that. That's really good. Larry they're Elder. making yeah. They're making a second one. Yeah, I think they're making a second one with Vody Bauckham and uh, some other people. I'm not really. Yeah, sure it was really good. Any. I recommend that to anybody. But was, uh, really yeah, good. and so, hey, he's not doing this because he's just trying to gain a platform. That, yeah. From what I can tell, uh, it seems to me like he's doing it because he cares about the truth. And he sees this as an enemy within the church. And it is in the church and it is divisive it's destructive it's damaging and it's evil it's sinful and it's antithetical to the gospel and nobody's going to come in your church and say hey i'm here to be divisive i'm here yeah. to be preach a different gospel they're not going to say that they're going to say things like this is about justice this is about love yeah. this is about caring for people this is about m making rights or making wrongs right. Uh, and they're going to use sort of a, they're going to borrow Christianese language and uh, Christianized language, right? And that's what they're going to use. And they're going to pull on your heartstrings. They're going to pull on your emotions. Uh, and then they're going to get you sad. And then they're going to get you angry. And they're going to split it up, be divisive. But hey, it does make money for them. Uh, and it does split up churches and that sort of a thing. And so I, I really appreciate his plea at the end of this chapter at the end of the book to say hey if you are a person who is imbi who has imbibed this ideology let it go mm -hmm. love that i read that i was like man i like i said I, I short chapter but it packs a punch you know I, I read that multiple times i was like man if you're somebody who's imbibed in this ideology it is a different ideology it is not a christian ideology um but if you're somebody who's imbibed in this, let it go. Find freedom in Christ, right? Romans 8.1, there's now no condemnation for those in Christ. You don't have to hold that weight. We don't have to bear that weight and bear that burden. Yeah. Jesus took that on the cross. Jesus paid for that. We're saved by his grace and we're reconciled yeah. thanks to God. And any sin or any racism or any of that, if it's called out, it has to specifically be pointed to, right? If I say, hey, Richard, you bothered me, you sinned against me, he's going to say how. And I'm going to have to say, hey, here's how, and here's the Bible. That's not what we see with social justice. That's not what we see with CRT, not what we see with the woke church. It's just mm -hmm. broad, overgeneralized, vague, and then it goes back to history. Well, I guess I got to point to something true. So this truly did happen in history, right? And it's something that everybody agrees with. Yeah, 
slavery did happen in history. That's true. So did redlining. So did Jim Crow. So did Emmett Till. That was evil. That was sinful. That was wrong. We agree with that. That's true. But like we just said a moment ago, it's picking and choosing. Which sins are we going to focus on? Are we going to focus on what the Romans did? Are we going to focus on what the Egyptians did? Are we going to focus on what Hitler and the Nazis did? Are we going to focus on what Paul Pot did? Are we going to focus on what are we going to focus on? Because history is replete with man doing evil, sinful things to other man. Uh, people from every tribe, tongue, and nation has been the oppressor at some point in time. Yeah. And people with, from every tribe, tongue, and nation has been on the receiving end, has been the victims. So if what we're going to do is we're going to say, based on this true historical fact, I'm oppressed today, we're all oppressed. And then what happens is we end up playing this roundabout circular thing where it's like, who's the most oppressed? Or are right. you the most oppressed? Or it's just a it's game. Like yeah, it just becomes right? a game. You know? Yeah, it's ridiculous. And really you can't get anywhere with that. You can't get any reconciliation with that. You can't get forgiveness with that. There's no gospel in that. It doesn't save you. There's no gospel. The gospel is we're reconciled. And mm -hmm. so if there's a problem, show me today and be specific. Show me today. What did I do to you? What did you do to me? And if we haven't done anything, like Jason Whitaker says, hey, Will hasn't done it. He's been nice to me. Uh, Jason's been nice to me. <clears throat> I can't say, hey, suppose I found out today, hey, uh, from dear old Christian, right? Or, or Richard, let's say if uh, your great, 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 great grandfather punched my great, great, great grandfather mother in the face, I wouldn't come to you and say, Richard, you and I, we have a beef, you know, right. and I need reparations because her nose was broken. And then somehow down the line, that's what caused all the rest of my family members' noses to be broken. You know, it's... Uh, it, come on. Yeah, yeah. We, we got to grow up. We got to mature as Christians. And I, I just don't think that a lot of Christians are in their Bibles. I don't think a lot. I like, I think a lot of Christians are just simply immature and mm -hmm. they have their preferred pastor that is popular that they listen to. And if that pastor has adopted and embraced this stuff, imbibed this stuff, as Vodi says, then they're going to be led the same direction. And it's just really sad to see. And I, I hope that one of the things we do, your channel, uh, Jason's channel, and many other people's channels, I, I hope one of the things that we do is we are able to speak truth and love and to yeah. show people, hey, we're not mean. We're not nasty guy. We're not trying to be mean. We're not trying to be hateful. Uh, we're, we're just doing our best to love on people by telling them the truth because love tells the truth. And, you know, that <laughs> full stop, that's it. Period, you know? Yeah. And uh, hopefully people can can take that and, you know, judge what we say by the Bible. Be in their Bibles and say, okay, well, you know what? That's true, you know? Or, hey, you're wrong. Here's how. Um, yeah. But what we can't do is be vague uh, and talk about something that happened 50, 60, 100, 400 years ago. You know, that's not helpful. We can't take what the world's doing and adopt it, embrace it, and promote it as if that's gospel, because it is not, you know? So. Right. Yeah, no, and that's, yeah, it's, it's so easy to slip into worldliness and um, just divisive heterodoxy, really, just it's not, and it sounds biblical, right? But the heresies, like you said, nobody, no, heretics never come in and say, hey, I'm going to start teaching heresy now. Just want to let everybody know that. I just and like how you say teaching. divisive and not divisive. <laughs> I was like, every time I hear it, because like I, I've, I've seen a lot of your videos, I'm like, man, div divisive. I'm like, I'm going to have to start saying it that way. I, I don't, <laughs> I yeah. Divisive. 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 Is that more Southern? Device, divisive, you know? I don't know. Is it divisive? I don't know. Is it more of a Northern, Westerner? I don't know. Divisive. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I feel like, I don't know who says divisive. Maybe somebody I've listened to is more divisive more divisive yeah emphasis <laughs> listening to myself uh that's dangerous he he closes out with revelation 7 9 uh which is great then i looked and behold a great multitude that no one can number from every nation from all the tribes and all the peoples and all the languages standing before the throne and before the lamb clothed with white robes with palm branches in their hands crying with a loud voice salvation belongs to our god who sits on the throne and to the lamb and to the angels who are standing 
around the throne and around the elders, the four living creatures, and they fell down on their faces before the throne and worshiped and saying, Amen. Blessing, glory, and wisdom, and thanksgiving, and honor, and power, and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. And that's, and that's, that's it, right? That's, that's the end. And, you know, it's, it doesn't mean we give up or we sit on the couch between now and then, but rather quite the opposite. And this doesn't, I mean, this isn't, I don't think at all, a commendation to say your church must look like this. It's not, and some people use that. That's taking it out of context. It's this the end of time. This is saying the gospel went throughout the whole world, to every nation, every tribe, every tongue. And there's this reconciliation because there was this breaking in at Babel, right? And God confused the languages. And now we have this unity again in Christ. And so I think that's really, that's a good place to end, honestly. Do um, you have any other last thoughts? No, I, th- I think that's great. And, you know, when the woke church or when CRT proponents, social justice proponents use scripture, it's oftentimes twisted. It's oftentimes out of context. They like to use Revelation 7 as if it's a proof text for what we are prescribed to do rather mm-hmm. than what describes what heaven will be like. So, of course, Heaven will be hell for a racist, right? Because there's going to be black people, there's going to be brown people, there's going to be, and I hate using colors because it just is superficial. It doesn't tell me a lick of anything besides yeah. what they look like on the outside. But I don't know any other way around it. But you know, uh, you know, there's going to be Mexican, there's going to be Jamaican, there's going to be Puerto Rican, there's going to be American, there's going to be Canadian, there's going to be. We could go on and on and on and on. There are going to be people from obviously every tribe, tongue, and nation. That's biblical. And praise God. Praise God for that. So if you're the type of person, you know, Christianity, it it has no room for anybody to look down on anybody on the basis of ethnicity, on the basis of of skin color, on the basis of male, female, on the basis of height, weight, strength, stamina, whatever. You know, there's going to be people, God's creative. God's very creative and God has a a very diverse creation. And I'm glad for that. Praise God for that. Mm -hmm. Revelation seven is about that. It's not going to be a boring place. It's going to be an exciting place. And if you are the type of person that looks up at people, and I think, uh, you know, these CRT woke social justice ideas of white privilege, uh, I think that is, you know, there's that famous video when woke and racist agree uh, satire comedy video. I think Ryan Long is one of the guys in it comedian. I don't think he's Christian. Anyway, uh, rabbit trails everywhere, squirrels. But, uh, you know, that is a way of looking up at people. You see a white guy, you say, you look up at him. He's up here. And I Mm -hmm. know he's up here because he's white. You see a black guy and you say, he's down here. And I know he's down here because he's black. That's racism in my mind. That's racism because you're judging somebody and you're looking down on people because of their skin color and you're looking up on some people because of their skin color and there is no room there's no room for that in the body of christ in the bride of christ there's no room for that why because of revelation 7 you where you're gonna be surrounded by people who are going to look like you right not gonna have the same skin color etc and so we got to be in our bibles uh we have to know what's descriptive what's prescriptive and all these sorts of things and and we have to be about truth. Uh, we have to ask is it, if it's true and, and what is the biblical ethic? How do we approach it as per what God has told us in his word? Because God's word is the standard, mm-hmm. not my opinion, uh, not Richard's opinion. As much as I agree with and like and love Richard <laughs> and love his opinion, I think he has a lot of the right opinions. Um, but uh, it's not our opinion. It's what does God say? It's not Ibram X. Kendi's opinion. It's not Robin D'Angelo's opinion. It's not Matt Chandler's opinion, David Platt's opinion. What does God say? What's the Bible say? What's the biblical ethic? And how do we apply that? And the CRT woke social justice stuff is not about that. It's not about God. It's not about what the Bible says. It's about none of that. In fact, much of it is antithetical to that. And so the warning that I think we all should be trying to get out there and communicate is that it is divisive. It's antithetical to the Bible. It's antithetical to the gospel. And we need to be, like he said, as shepherds warning the flock, Hey, abstain from this. Don't, don't go with that. Be biblical. Uh, Say what the Bible says. Uh, Don't adopt and embrace what the world is saying. Uh, And so 
that's all yeah. that's all i got great great book really good book it is Packer. yeah Packs a lot of punch, very short easy to read you know it is it's surprising I me mean, it's two over 200 pages 233 uh he's got the um the dallas statement in here which stirred a lot of waters in 2018 and then the original resolution nine from 2019 within the sbc and then the altered gutted completely turned on its head because resolution nine, i don't know if everybody knows but it was not um intended to be pro critical theory as analytical tools or anything like that it was actually written by i believe a pastor in california like san francisco central valley area and it was anti it was it was saying no these are bad this is warning and they basically just took it and just twisted it all and that's the uh, resolutions committee who did that with curtis woods and several other james merritt was on there and uh, you know the fruit is just is is abhorrent and yeah so he he shows this quite evident throughout the whole text of his book so it's good so go get it if you haven't read it um i've enjoyed it i know you've enjoyed it will and but yeah everybody if you've not read this book yet go get it pick it up um it's a really it's really easy read it really is and he has a lot of good good insights that really it's very relevant because it's, I mean, talks about 2019, 2020, and there's a lot of just real, real helpful stuff. So, um, yeah, this has been a fun time talking to Will here, talking to Jason Whitaker, talking to um, quite a few other guests on the show as well. So I hope you found this helpful. Go ahead and like and subscribe if you have not done that. Drop a comment. Tell me now if you've already read the book, if you enjoyed the book. And uh, until next time, we'll see you next time. Be against the world for it. All right. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Will.